I'm now talking to Alan Kay. He is one of the leading pioneers in the development of the modern personal computer and the graphic user interface that we're so familiar with today. He's also the president of Viewpoints Research, which is a company in Los Angeles. Nonprofit. Nonprofit company in Los Angeles. So, Alan, we're talking about collective intelligence today. What do you see as the future of collective intelligence? Where, where is this going? Well, I think you know, uh, anthropologists think that humans have been on the earth for 100,000 years, and we're social creatures, and so we've had a form of collective intelligence throughout this time, and the results have not been very pretty. And so uh, 400 years ago, a better way of dealing with uh, uh, magnifying collective intelligence called science was invented. And it had the aspect of sharing knowledge, which people have been doing for a long time. But it also had something that people hadn't thought of before, and that is how to be really critical about um, the open ideas that people come up with. Is that really that new? I mean, didn't science go back thousands of years? No, science... Science as, uh, you know, when it meant knowledge. Scientia me means knowledge, and so the gathering of knowledge. And certainly uh, Aristotle was interested in biology, and with people have been interested in explanations. But gen generally speaking, you could say that human beings have been interested in explanations, but they've been willing to uh, be satisfied with really weak ones over the years. And the, the big difference between uh, the last 400 years and the time before that is that people, for the first time, wanted to have strong explanations. They wanted to have these explanations be in terms of mechanisms of various kinds. To, to explain what? You mean explain natural phenomena? Ex explain natural phenomena, which includes us, since we're part of this, to explain systems of all kinds, mm -hmm. to explain cause and effect relationships. So we want to have a clear understanding of the world we live in? That's the basic idea, and by saying it that way, uh, I think we agree that human beings for 100,000 years haven't had a clear idea of it. We've made up stories, and we've been satisfied with those stories as explanations, and what science wanted to do was to come up with something stronger than a story, um, even given the fact that our brains uh, turn everything into stories. So the idea is, can you factor what's wrong with the way we think into the process and try and deal with our errors in various ways. And so the successful invention of science uh, partly involved a social structure in which uh, the people who did the criticism were usually not the people who came up with the theories. So the idea is that even when you're trying to be a good scientist, you also like your own theories. Let's, but, let's say we acquired a huge amount of knowledge. We learned to explain everything in the world. Does that mean that we would necessarily be better off? Well, I think that if you had cancer and you went to a person who understood cancer and could do something about it, you would feel better off. So one, one of the ways of looking at this is that there's kind of an interaction between philosophy and uh, pragmatics. And uh, there's a problem with people being way too pragmatic often at the expense of other things, but generally speaking, most people would like to live as long as they can, would like to be as happy as long as they can, would like to be able to take care of their children, and a whole bunch of these things are facilitated uh, very strongly, not just by understanding the physical world, but the social world. Well, you think it's necessary to have a coherent world view, a framework of looking at the world in which you can fit everything and it all makes no. sense? No. In fact, I don't think anybody can do that, and science doesn't take that view. So science went through several stages, and there was the 19th century stage where they sort of second stage Newton, and they thought they were nailing everything down, and then we had the 20th century with quantum mechanics and relativity, and people then realized, oh, now we know what's going on. Uh, science is a way of taking views on stuff that we can't get to directly, and like the mariners, in the 15th century who were the precursors of science wanting to make maps that were accurate rather than ones that were the way the world was supposed to be, like the Garden of Eden was on the medieval maps. But instead what they wanted was 
were maps that were as accurate as they could be and they wanted annotations on them as to uh, where the errors were and who had seen this. And if you look at a, a, you know, a map for the age of ex- exploration, then the, uh, you, you see sci- the, you know, the first scientific writings in the world done by observation and uh, not a coherent worldview but a patchwork quilt that's supported by observations. And so science now realizes, oh, you have to open up to everything and you just have to be very careful about when you're claiming as something is good knowledge or not. Now, when I talk about a worldview, I'm talking about a set of governing principles that right. apply in all situations. Does it, is it necessary to have that kind of worldview where you perceive the world as you know, somehow governed according to some set of principles that can be defined? Well, I think that one of the things you could do is uh, you could take a stance about outlook. So, for example, suppose suppose one night you go to a, 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 a theater, beautiful people on the stage, beautiful music, great words, you're thrilled beyond measure. The next night you go to the very same building, even see some of the same people on the stage, you also hear great words. First night you're going to Shakespeare, and the second night you're going to a political rally. And if you're in the same frame of mind in both of those, uh, you're in trouble because... Uh, the what we ha- basically in the modern world we're in a situation where we need to be able to choose what mode we're going to be or what mood we're going to be in when we're dealing with things. Are we going to be in a mood uh, that is full of feeling and affect, or are we going to be in a mood in which we're like this and just letting things through very very carefully? Um, and I think that. That's a huge difference in the modern world versus uh, the Middle Ages, for example. You know, we're talking about intelligence, and one of the hardest things to study is the human mind. Yeah. Very little is known about it. I don't even think there's a working definition of normalcy. So is the process of applying collective intelligence, could that be applied to unravel the workings of the mind? Because the world is largely driven by human desires. I want what I want, and here's the price I'm willing to pay to get it, and here's the price I'm willing to make other people pay to get it. Yeah, well, you could certainly make a very simplistic argument, but not a bad one, that uh, most of the trappings of civilization are mechanisms and principles that are designed to oppose uh, the genetic structure that our brains were shaped with. So there are (coughs) anthropologists (coughs) have found about 300 universals across all cultures, including the desire for revenge and including the desire for status and language and stories and, and so forth. And uh, things that are non-universals are ideas like uh, equal rights. Technology has been changing very rapidly in recent years. We are becoming dependent on this technology at a rate that some people think is uh, actually uh, alarming. Uh, is there any- have we really thought through the consequences of so quickly becoming dependent on all of this technology? Well, I think the, you know, Thoreau said uh, we become the tools of our tools. And when he was at, uh, when the transatlantic cable went in in 1865, he was an old man, and they asked him what he thought of it, and he said he was rather afraid that he would find out that in it, European princess had just gotten a new hat. So I believe that nails it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is not new. It's just that most people are not thinkers like Thoreau was. Thoreau could understood that he lived in a construct and he lived in a technological age as technological in its own way as ours because any, especially anything that is post printing press could hardly be more technological as a set of media that shape things. The big problem is not whether we're dependent on this technology, but whether we understand it or not. And the thing that lags is getting any new idea through the educational system so the people who are not intrinsically interested in it, which is most people, can actually be exposed to these ideas anyway. 